Yes, you read that right. I'm not being obtuse. I'm looking over politics in the works of Dr. Seuss. You might say, they're just kids books. What could you possibly mean? I say, sit back while I set the scene. Seuss, or Ted Geisel, as his parents named him, has had much analysis from folks dressed so prim. So to make sure that we are all on the same page, let us look at the themes that are very simple to gauge. To point out the most obvious, Ted was a Democrat. We do not have to stretch for it, much like an acrobat. He supported Roosevelt and decried the leaders of the Axis. Those who felt otherwise would make him suffer anaphylaxis. Seuss became mainstream during World War II, and using his art skills, he knew just what to do. He made political comics supporting FDR's cause, even the parts of it that get less applause. Sadly, he believed that internment was right, and also that the US should do much more to fight. Him and John Haynes Holmes exchanged very heated words. Ted saying a lot of things that are very backwards, not quite surprising considering his earlier work, which also paints Ted as a complete racist jerk. While Seuss would apologize for this aspect of his life, the way he drew Asians would remain pretty rife. Now what were Ted's views on America first? Well to put it quite bluntly, he thought it was the worst. Denouncing both Charles's, Lindbergh and Coughlin, viewing their foreign policies as a huge Mortalson, they are mouthpieces of Hitler, Ted Geisel would cry, with others denounced including Wheeler and Nye. It wasn't just the far right that Geisel would denounce, sometimes the far left would cause Ted here to pounce, saying they were nothing more than just a Lindbergh pawn. Though after Stalingrad, for them he would fawn. While the war was going on, Ted was a little bit shook. So in order to stay sane, he wrote his very first book, kickstarting a career free from all this politics. No wait, the opposite is true. Gosh darn it, fiddlesticks. While Seuss was not as explicit as before, the messages he espoused would remain part of his lore. While some are quite obvious, we'll get to them in a bit, let us begin with the ones where the meanings are split, his most famous work being the cat in the hat. Depending on your outlook, you might think this falls flat. Originally written to combat child illiteracy, some would go, there's no way that this can be all that we see. Suggestions arose that this was a denouncement of authority, claiming the cat was some sort of dictatorial minority. You might go, that's a stretch. Well, how about that in lieu? Some debate of the themes within Horton Hears a Who. There are a lot of interpretations, some of which are very wrong, but that particular one I will have to prolong. The first suggested is the idea of attacking isolation. Given Seuss's past, it's easy to see that correlation. Another interpretation that many would please was that this served as an apology for his treatment of the Japanese, even dedicating the book to Mitsugi Nakamura, a man from Kyoto Su said he loved a plethora. But if you really want a theory that requires a lot of contortion, some have argued that this book is a denouncement of abortion. Citing the phrase a person's a person, no matter how small, while his second wife Audrey said, that's not what he meant at all. Marvin K. Mooney is what we will talk about next, though its themes have absolutely nothing to do with its text. Along with his friend, a humorist named Art Butchwald, seeing the Watergate hearings, Ted Geisel was appalled. So he rewrote the story and sent it to Art, with only one thing to set it apart. He crossed out Mooney and replaced it with Dick. No, not in that way, you pervy lunatic. Another short one is the tale of the Grinch. So fast, I can easily say it in a pinch. A critique of Christmas's intense consumerism and the rest of the US's capitalistic dogmatism. Another short one is the tale of King Louis Katz, a very short tale denouncing autocrats. Ah yes, with all this time, I guess we're finally here. The ones whose messages can be seen from the exosphere. We'll start off with the story of Yertle the Turtle and how this tale's message was a very simple hurdle. A short tale about a greedy evil tyrant who falls despite being very aspirant. Given this was published in the immediate post-war, this was mocking a guy that history will abhor. Speaking of which, let's talk about the tale of the Sneetches and look at the message that this short story teaches. A book about a yellow, feathered population who spend the whole story practicing discrimination. Some have a green star while others do not. Then a man comes around and look what he brought, a machine that sells stars which many accept but the upper class decided to remain pretty percept. The guy exploits them too, and then the machine breaks. And after not knowing who is who, their racism flakes. Although I use the dreaded R word, different types of discrimination are not exactly unheard. The use of a star and the year it was made suggests that anti-Semitism was what was portrayed. The Butter Battle book is what is up next. 
Similarly, this story is not too complex. Published in 1984, during the year of Reagan, the story is something that is not really too vague in, critiquing the Cold War within its final years, comparing it to how two nations put on their butter smears. One puts it on the top, the other on the bottom, and if they see the other, they immediately shot him. A critique of how both nations have many flaws and praise, and that any true conflict will set the world ablaze. And finally, to reach this video's climax, let us discuss about the themes within the book, The Lorax. You might say, this is obvious, we all know the drill. I say, I have many more minutes in this video to fill. Much like the Grinch, it tackles capitalist consumerism, but with a heavy emphasis on environmental protectionism. Telling the story of the Wunzler, a rich bougie pig, who cuts down all these trees to make a stupid thingamajig. The Lorax tries to stop him, but it falls on deaf ears, and the area falls down due to him not shifting gears. But there's a glimmer of hope, as there is one more seed, and the Wunzler tells a child a message to heed. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better, it's not. While now, many across the US admire it, back then there were many who read it and got perspirant. The book was denounced by many, particularly in logging towns, each action making them look like nothing but clowns. In 1995, a woman named Terry Burkett gave this book a read and it made her short circuit, penning a Seuss parody known as the Truax, whose storytelling prowess many saw was too lax. Being the story of the Lorax but flipping the roles, now the Lorax is the villain, while the tree choppers have souls. Not only was the message seen as a metaphorical flogging, the woman who wrote it directly profited from logging. Now the Lorax is not only famous for the book, as it had an animation that expanded its outlook. Released 7 months after the book's publication, despite being 24 minutes, it made use of its duration. One message that is very funny, considering the BS of Terry, the TV short even made the opposition's point unwary, pointing out that if the Wunzler just decided to close up shop, employment in the area will massively drop. The Lorax has no answer, even says I see your point, but the Wunzler doesn't care as long as his money remains joint. There's another adaptation that many of you know, though your perspective of it is probably low. Something very typical of most Hollywood productions is taking the message but making many reductions. While the length of the story is now almost thrice, the OG book was much more concise. For starters, the Wunzler was now a pretty emo boy, which filled many people on Tumblr with a plethora of joy. Rather than being greedy and then learning his error, he learns his lesson very early on without going through much terror. Illumination did the exact same thing with the Grinch, the person learning their lesson in too much of a pinch. But wait, before this video gets way too off topic, let's go back to the Lorax with a message so myopic. The Wunzler's family arrives and they pressure him to chop all the trees down, and due to these idiots, Sneedville becomes a ghost town. Then out of nowhere comes Aloysius O'Hare, who becomes the next Wunzler by literally selling air basically choosing to make him a socialist political cartoon, which many would argue was way too much of an impune. Removing the nuance makes the message too drawn, but from the perspective of this year, this seems a little too spot on. But like many stuff like this, I must have to ask, is this film really the one that is up to the task? Because for all of its supposed critiques of capitalist consumerism, this movie is no stranger to commercialistic fetishism. In the lead up, the Lorax was literally slapped on every brand, even the ones that nobody could withstand. Yes, they used the Lorax to advertise a car. Was it a hybrid at least? Not remotely, in fact, quite noticeably far. Now this is really stupid, that we don't have to anoint, but the freaking film itself makes fun of this point. Is there anything redeeming about this piece of crappy cinema? Well. Danny DeVito gives it a little bit of stamina. So anyways, I finished saying stuff that you already know. Now I must conclude this fascinating show. Thanks for watching this video, I hope that you enjoyed. Go to my Patreon if you want to keep me employed. However, if money for any of you is bare, all you really have to do is like, comment, and share. If you want to see other stuff, follow my Twitter or Discord. Now I can stop rhyming because I am so freaking bored.